I'd like to uh, thank again a couple members of our uh, planning team, Lisa Dorner and Brian McGinnis, who are going to co-chair this session. And Brian will be introducing our speaker. I would like to begin today by acknowledging our gathering here in the traditional territory of the Dakota peoples. As one of the two major indigenous groups in Minnesota, the Dakota have lent their place names to the very city and even state where we are presently gathering today. Like so many indigenous educators, the Dakota continue to use the best of what they know from their traditional teaching and learning traditions alongside everything that we are presently coming to understand about effective immersion language teacher training and practice to sustainably renew their cultural voice and legacy in such changed circumstances of the present. My name is Brian McGinnis, and on behalf of the University of Minnesota, uh, for whom I have privileged to work in teacher education on our Duluth campus, and as a member of the 2016 conference planning committee, Indigenous Language Strand, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Teresa Terry McCarty of the University of California, Los Angeles. Some of Terry's many accomplishments are listed in the conference biography. Her vast publication record in both education and anthropology can be very easily explored via the internet, as can her landmark 12th annual Brown Lecture that she completed in 2015 for the American Educational Research Association so that any child may succeed, educational pathways towards justice and the promise of Brown. As we look around the room today, I recognize many world-class indigenous language experts and educators. It is customary in many of our traditions to honor those who have come before us, those who have helped create pathways towards the future, especially one that is inclusive of native languages and cultures for our children. From helping lay the foundations for legislation, native teacher education, authentic and inclusive classrooms, youth empowerment through education, among many other things, Terry McCarty has been leader and ally, exemplar and inspiration. Today's plenary, Indigenous Revitalization, Immersion and Homeschool Community Connection, Research and Praxis Among Context. Let us please give her a very warm reception. Pidamaya Miigwech, thank you and welcome Terry. Well, Brian, thank you so much for that uh, just lovely, um, heartwarming introduction. I'm so pleased to be here. Good afternoon, and good afternoon to those of you who are out, who are not out, but who are in the uh, North Star Ballroom. Uh, I'm honored to be here on Dakota homelands, as Dr. McGinnis uh, just said, and among the Ojibwe people and all the many Native nations that have made uh, Minneapolis and this place such a historic and important place for indigenous rights, including in education. Is the microphone okay? Okay, okay. So I wanna also extend my, my deep appreciation to Drs. Diane Tedick and Roy Lister for the invitation to come to this, uh, this event. Um, this is, I've heard so much about this conference and so much about Carla. And it's just a privilege to be here among such a diverse and distinguished group of co-presenters and, uh, and of participants. I believe it's important to acknowledge where your knowledge comes from. So what I share with you today grows out of my work over many years with Native American and other indigenous educators, communities, and schools. And I'm here because of their teachings and their generosity in inviting me to join their efforts to provide an equitable and uplifting education for their children. Whoops. 
I was on the right place. Um, so one of those teachers for me was an elder by the name of Dorothy Sicotti. Years ago when I was working as a curriculum developer at the Rough Rock School in the Navajo Nation, I was moved by Mrs. Sicotti's words. She had grandchildren attending this bilingual bicultural school. And she said to us in Navajo, if your child learns only English, you've lost your child. Those words have stayed with me over the years, and they're at the core of the message in my talk today. Indigenous language immersion is many faceted. Uh, there are many pathways, as we heard in the session by Makalapua uh, Alan Constre and Ka Kalihua Krug yesterday. Uh, so these programs are all tailored to local contexts, and they're implemented both inside and outside of schools. But at the heart of all of these programs, I believe, is an intense desire and commitment not to lose the next generation, or the next or the next, but to strengthen intergenerational connections through the originary language. As I was recently told by a native Hawaiian faculty member at the University of Hawaii, Hilo's College of Hawaiian Education, language is what binds us together the essence, he said, of what makes us, us. These remarks suggest that indigenous language immersion, which is also called revitalization immersion, or education for language revitalization, is about more than the purely linguistic, or the purely academic, or pedagogic. It's more even than the cultivation of bi-multilingualism. Dianetic Donna Christian, and uh, Tara Fortune, sorry, I'm still, I don't know what's, uh, there we go. So a little bit of a sensitive flipper here. In their, uh, in their writings on immersion education, they describe indigenous language immersion as a third model of immersion, um, distinguishing it from one way uh, French, English, French immersion in Canada, for example, and two-way models such as the Spanish-English dual immersion programs in the United States. In contrast, they say, ILI, particularly its school-based forms, grows out of two related realities, and one is extreme language endangerment, the other is extreme education inequalities. Indigenous peoples constitute about 5% of the world's population, but they speak about 70% of the world's 7,500 7, known spoken languages. As this ethnologue map shows, virtually all of these languages, along with many others, Irish, Scots Gaelic, Basque, just to name a few that are present at this conference, are rapidly losing ground to dominant or more properly, dominating languages and speakers. The scholars who keep track of these things in ethnologue report that a third of the world's languages are in some stage of loss or shift, and that 5% of the languages that were spoken just 60 years ago are no longer in use. And I'm quoting Simons and Lewis here in a, a recent 2013 chapter. These are statistics that those working in the field of language revitalization and endangerment know well. And as this map suggests, the losses are particularly acute in Australia, Canada, the Americas, and the Pacific, regions of the world where a particular form of colonization, which Mufweni calls settlement colonization, distinguishing it, for example, from trade colonization, displaced indigenous inhabitants, resulting in profound language shift. In virtually all of these cases, we can trace the causal chain to what my colleague, K. Chanina Lomawaima, and I have called erase and replace policies and practices. Erase native languages, replace with English. Erase native religions, replace with Christianity and so on. 
Well, the point I want to make here is that language education programming can never be examined or implemented independently from these larger policy discourses and the socio-historical and socio-political context in which those discourses reside. Context is crucial. A distinguishing feature of ILI, then, is that it operates under conditions of decolonization and, as a direct result of that, a diminishing speaker base. Diminishing numbers of speakers and inequitable access to higher education mean that there are few indigenous language teachers and that many language teachers are second language learners themselves. So ILI programs are faced with what some of us call growing their own teaching staff and curricula, which is a long-term resource-intensive process. The goal, first and foremost, is to renormalize the language as a language of the classroom and, more importantly, of everyday use. This is achieved through pedagogies that emphasize indigenous ways of knowing, and being, and that are keyed to the local culture. School-based programs have another extremity to address, and that is enduring education inequalities. For even as more indigenous children enter school speaking a dominant language, English for Native American students in the United States, for example, English speaking ability has not overcome profound achievement disparities. These data are from a recent uh, analysis of National Assessment of Education Progress, or NAEP, data from 19,000 Native American students attending 3,900 different schools. And the analysis was by Lumbee scholar Brian Brayboy and Maori scholar Margaret Maka who report on these widening achievement disparities between Native students and their white English-speaking peers. Just 51% of Native American children graduate from high school, they report. And of those, only 10% complete a college degree. So it's under such conditions of linguistic, educational, and social inequality that indigenous revitalization immersion emerged about three decades ago with the combined goals of developing students' proficiency in the indigenous language as a second language, <coughs> whoops, I'm sorry, my, my, my uh, flipper is getting ahead of my talk here. Let's go back to this. Um, developing students' proficiency in the indigenous language as a second language, promoting cultural knowledge, continuity, and identity, and producing academic outcomes, including English language arts and literacy, on par with those of mainstream students. And this is from um, a chapter in uh, the book by Diane Tedek and her colleagues by William Pila Wilson and Kawanoe Kamana, who are uh, uh, very well known for their work with indigenous immersion, particularly in Hawaii. <clears throat> so given my, these goals, my talk today asks two key questions. What can we learn from indigenous language immersion to improve education practice for indigenous and other non-dominant learners? And what do these programs teach us about promoting equity, positive identity development, and personal and communal well-being? To address these questions, I'm going to share three ILI case examples based on research I've undertaken in collaboration with indigenous colleagues. Before doing that, though, I want to address the goal of academic parity. What do we know about learners' academic progress in ILI? Among the oldest and most well-documented ILI programs are those for Maori students in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In 2004, University of Auckland professor Stephen May and his colleagues Richard Hill and Sarah Tiakawai published a comprehensive review of the literature 
on indicators of good practice in bilingual immersion education, research that was supported by the New Zealand Ministry of Education, which is important, as I'll address in, in a moment. Their report took into account the international literature on bilingual immersion education and studies that were specific to New Zealand. So what did they find? Well, first, and not surprisingly, I, I think, these researchers found that higher levels of immersion, not surprisingly, resulted in higher levels of language proficiency in the target language, particularly when the target language was a second language for students. And they also found that the most effective programs ranged from 50 to 100 percent immersion in the target language with 90 to 100 percent immersion, what they called level one immersion, most effective in achieving bilingualism, biliteracy, and academic parity. And further, these researchers noted that to achieve these outcomes, learners need a minimum of six years of at least 50 percent immersion at the primary level. Uh, this finding is consistent, we all know, with a large body of, of research on second language acquisition, along with strong parent community involvement and central education agency resourcing. But they also noted the need for, and I'm quoting now, an active commitment to equality. Positive student-teacher and student-student relationships, and the use of cooperative learning and teaching approaches. And in a subsequent uh, in-depth ethnographic case study of one of the longest-lived uh, Maori immersion schools, Rakao Manga, it's for short, for a little bit longer name, which is a pre-K through 12 school on New Zealand's North Island, they found uh, further evidence for the use of these pedagogies and also for a very carefully planned English transition policy that begins at about year four. So these were the kinds of pedagogies that they said are most effective in promoting academic parity as well as revitalization of the originary language. Moreover, they said that these pedagogies um, and we heard this in yesterday's session as well, foster what they called the development of students as becoming citizens of the world. And it was very um, powerfully said yesterday that the world needs such citizens who are the products of these programs. Similar kinds of findings have been reported for Navajo, Hawaiian, um, Mohawk, Cree, Mi'kmaq, and other ILI, ILI programs in the United States, and I'd be happy to share some of those sources um, in the question answer or after the talk. Well, as I was putting the final touches on this talk just a few days ago, Maori Television News announced findings from a five-year audit of Maori education, <coughs> excuse me, which, in the reporter's words, slammed the lack of progress amongst Maori students in our education system. The answer to Maori education woes, the, the report continued, is within full immersion learning. Statistics show that Maori students in full immersion schools get better results than those in the mainstream. But those results are largely neutralized, the report continued, because most Maori students are in mainstream schools. So this report comes just a little more than a decade after May et al.'s government-issued report and reflects the all too familiar disjunct between policy relevant research and policy implementation. Before leaving this part of the discussion, I want to point to other evidence about the damaging consequences of this disjunct. In 2007, researchers from the universities of Oxford, British Columbia, and Victoria published a paper in the journal Cognitive Development entitled Aboriginal Language Knowledge and Youth Suicide. 
Perhaps some of you have read some of this uh, work by this team of researchers. They've done quite a bit of study on this in the context of Canadian First Nations communities. Carefully controlling for other variables, these researchers found that knowledge of an aboriginal language, which they called a marker of cultural persistence, corresponded strongly with the health and well-being of aboriginal youth. In fact, these researchers found that teen suicide dropped to zero in communities in which there was active use of and support for the indigenous language. So this is a critical avenue for further research, but more importantly, I think, for immediate dialogue and action. And it highlights the fact that these programs are about much more than academics or even language per se. They are, as we heard yesterday in the session on immersion, indigenous immersion, about building healthy families, communities, relationships, and future. We also heard this today in Iris Stacy's session on Mohawk immersion. So this leads me to my three case examples. As you hear these accounts, I'd like for you to listen for four broad themes. Holism. ILI is a whole child, whole curriculum, whole community approach, to quote the title of a wonderful book by Fred Genesee, published in 1994. Relationality. ILI is about building intra and intergenerational relationships of caring, love, which we heard and talked about yesterday, responsibility, reciprocity, and respect. Belonging, ILI fosters a sense of belonging and kinship, thereby contributing to positive cultural identity and to the well-being of students, their families, and communities. And self-determination, ILI is about parent, parental and community choice in determining the content, process, and medium of instruction for their children. And as was stated yesterday, this then is also part of indigenous nation building. So the first case example. The teacher's statement at the top of this slide was the first entry in my field journal when my colleague at Arizona State University, where I was then, Brian Brayboy, and I sat down with four Diné or Navajo teachers and the bilingual ESL director at the K-5 Puente de Hojo Trilingual Magnet School in Northern Arizona. We were there to launch a two and a half year study of the school's ILI program, part of a, la a larger study, a national study of promising practices in American Indian education. Nestled at the base of mountains that are sacred to the Diné and other indigenous peoples of this region, Puente de Hojo, which means bridge of beauty in Spanish and Navajo, has as its mission bridging achievement disparities between language minority and language majority students. But as the, this quote indicates, doing so not through the all too common compensatory model of bilingual education so common in the United States, but rather an approach designed to uh, build students by multilingual, multicultural competence, all students' competence in these areas. The school does this by offering a Spanish-English two-way immersion program for Latino and Anglo students and a one-way Navajo immersion program for Native American students learning Navajo as a second language. And this is no small feat in Arizona, which, as many of you know, is one of the most politically conservative states in the nation, where both bilingual education and ethnic studies make that everything but white ethnic studies have been officially banned in public schools. 
Puente de Rojon is able to offer its immersion programs because it is a magnet school, that is, enrollment is voluntary, and it has very strong community and parent support. I think it's one of two or three bilingual education programs in public schools in the state. In the weeks and months following that initial site visit, I interviewed teachers, students, parents, grandparents, and I conducted two years of non-participant observation in the classrooms and schools. So to give you a sense of this program, what I'd like to do is take you on a, a very brief visual tour of the school and, 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 and just ask you to, to look at and observe the linguistic lands, landscape of this school. And I'll intersperse those visual images with some of the voices of teachers and students. <clears throat> so this is what one sees on approaching the school. And there's a little map down there in the bottom. I, I know that not everybody is familiar with this part of the world. But if you can see the, the red dot uh, in the southwestern part of the, of the country in the state of Arizona, that's where this program is located. So this is walking up to the school. You see the sacred mountains in the background. Um, and you notice these, these murals that uh, are adjacent to the entryway. These are mur murals that were created by students um, at the school uh, under the, the, the tutelage of a very well-known Navajo artist by the name of Shanto Begay. And this is a, an image or a picture of the Navajo girl's puberty ceremony, this four-day ceremony. And every morning at dawn, she runs toward the east, and she's, she's rooted on by her, her family and her peers, who all always stay behind her. And this is, this is part of her preparation and endurance as she makes the transition into young womanhood. Another mural is of Navajo country, Denepakea. Um, and so this, uh, this is a, a public school in an off-reservation city, but uh, the reservation is within about 10 miles, or one part of the border of the reservation is within about 10 miles. So <clears throat> it's a school that values place. And you can see by the artists of Puente de Hojo there at the bottom of that. And these are them. <laughs> and that's with Chanteau Begay creating the murals. The school's motto is, the, in English, the power of two, languages and cultures. I think it's actually more than that. And this represents a de facto language policy at the school, that learning more than one language is a good thing. We know English is the dominant language, but we also believe that all three languages should be on equal terms. And this is by one of the school administrators. Further evidence of that can be seen in the signage at the school, which normalizes by multilingualism in the context of this larger macro policy environment of English only. And inside the school, the, the bulletin boards and, and uh, classrooms are just abundant with multilingual signage including of other languages that are not part of the immersion program. The telling thing of, of this particular display to me is that it recognizes that in our increasingly multilingual and globalizing world, dominant English is not the only key to success and to power. The curriculum is in the, in, the, in the Navajo Immersion Program is centered on this notion of a beautiful life, walking in beauty. And these are four themes that um, are associated with that. And, and what is not here is that they're also keyed to the four cardinal directions, which are affiliated with sacred mountains in Navajo worldview and, and, and way of of, uh, of seeing and, and being. And each of these areas then will have different disciplinary studies that students learn about, astronomy with earth and sky, nutrition, physical education with health, um, ethnobotany, biology, different uh, types of science under living things, kinship, eh, 
um, and um, social studies, Navajo history under family and community. So it's an integrated approach to language learning in the context of culture. And here you just see a few more examples of that. I, I will just uh, draw your attention to the image at the far right of the screen where students are being shown the, the science and the craft of making a sand painting, which is a very important part of a blessing way ceremony and is, it takes years and years and lifetime to learn these skills, but it also happens to be full of lessons in mathematics, various aspects of science, physical sciences, as well as the art and the craft and the medicine of making such uh, a sand painting. This is an example of those teacher-made materials I talked to you about a little while ago. And in every classroom while we were doing this study, this song script was prominent, Shih Nasha. It means literally, I walk about, but the teachers translated as, I'm alive. And the reference here is to the Navajos' um, incarceration in the late 1900s at a uh, concentration camp in Fort Sumner, New Mexico. And the song tells the story of their release and return to Dinepakea, Navajo country. And teachers incorporated this song in their history lessons and social studies lessons, as well as language arts. One teacher remarked to me, this song tells the story of how our people actually survived. Parents and grandparents are in the classroom supporting the teachers and the children. I love to hear from parents my child could actually talk to their grandparents, one teacher said and commented on how emotional this is. This is emotional work as well as intellectual work. It's also a strengths-based approach that explicitly rejects deficit labels um, and what Luis Enrique Lopez refers to as the compensatory condition of bilingualism and bilingual education in the United States and elsewhere. In the two immersion se sessions that I've sat in since I've been here, one of the themes that has been discussed is that immersion, indigenous immersion, is a process of healing, healing from the past, from the forced severing of language and culture. And this teacher speaks to this when I, I asked her, are you, are your children, are you raising your children in Navajo? And she goes back and reaches into her own past and talks about her own healing from um, being ridiculed for being a speaker of Navajo and how being a teacher at the school really opened my eyes, she said, to the importance of my language and culture. And the students, too, evince this relationality, respect, reciprocity, responsibility. This young girl, these are not, this is, these are not their actual uh, pictures, but she talked about her responsibility to learn her heritage language and how she would have felt if she did not embark on this journey, that she feels it's a responsibility. And she was actually teaching her little sister who was slated to enter the school in the next year. <clears throat> so finally, in terms of academic achievement, as measured by dominant norms, these students have consistently met or exceeded all the benchmarks, federal, state, district. And in recent years, this school has been ranked in the top four schools. In the district, higher, kids are scoring higher even than the children in white, mostly white, affluent schools in the district. Importantly, the students who do the best are those who've been in the program the longest, something else we know from abundant research. And of course, English is only part of what is happening in this kind of environment. They also have the benefit of learning their originary language and of doing a lot more than that.
So let me turn to my second example. We go to another part of the southwestern United States, Mojave country, which is located along the Colorado River at the place where the states of Nevada, Arizona, and California meet. And we go now to a project that's not technically ILI, but which through a process of language documentation catalyzed this whole community-wide immersion in the indigenous language and culture. And I share this example with the permission of colleagues at Fort Mojave, of course, because it illustrates both the challenges and the possibilities for revitalization immersion when the speaker base is very small. So this work began in 2009 when I was co-directing Arizona State University's Center for Indian Education. And one December day, in walked this remarkable woman, Natalie Diaz, uh, of Mojave, Acamelo Atam, and Spanish descent. And this is her at Fort Mojave. And this is a photograph from a PBS NewsHour interview with her that was entitled, On a Mission for Preservation. At the time we met, she had just completed her MFA and she'd returned to her natal community, Fort Mojave, and she and a group of, of, of young people were intending to start a language reclamation project. So you should know there are only about 20 speakers of Mojave, all elderly. One is Hubert McCord, who is the last fluent speaker of Mojave bird songs, which are a core cultural practice. And Natalie, Mr. McCord, and a group of others wanted to preserve the knowledge contained in these songs as a community resource for language learning and for learning about the culture. So Natalie came to us and said, can you help? And so in collaboration with Natalie, we convened a summit of Mojave elders who laid out a plan, a language plan, and they asked us to write a grant uh, to NSF's Documenting Endangered Languages program, which we did in collaboration with the tribe, and uh, we were awarded a small grant, and that's how the work started. So over the next four years, Natalie and a small group of Mojave youth, parents, and elders documented hundreds of Mr. McCord's songs, including his explanations of their cultural and historic meaning. These are precious, precious recordings, and these young people are so determined to do this while the elders are still with them and can help all of us, and them especially, understand them. So this then became the basis for a digital library of Mojave cultural and linguistic resources. And importantly, and this is what uh, the piece I want to just talk about a little bit here, it also became the context for intergenerational sharing and immersion in Mojave language and culture. We had some expert help, including from UC Berkeley professor Leanne Hinton at the left, and from the University of Minnesota's own Professor Mary Hermes, uh, who with her husband provided invaluable technical assistance on language documentation, which she has been doing so successfully with, um, with Ojibwe peoples. So my role, as you can see here, was to was sort of as the ethnographer of the, of the project to document the process of language revitalization itself. Let me just say this is a very unusual kind of circumstance. 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, people wouldn't have wanted cameras in their faces when they're performing these songs. It's very non, to say it's non-traditional is putting it mildly. But these elders are so concerned about their language that they said, we're not gonna worry about that. We want this for the next generation and the generation after that when we're no longer here as we are with Natalie and the others right now to be able to do this in person. So what evolved was this grassroots community-driven community education project that drew in a core group, group of youth and eventually then through that worked itself into the local school. It's too early to call this immersion and in contexts like Mojave with so few speakers, not to mention language teachers, school-based immersion may not be viable or even desired. But that doesn't negate the potential for it in the future. And as Natalie noted in a 2012 interview, when the teens start learning the language, the parents show up. The teens are actually in a position where they can go home and teach their parents. The teens are going to be the next group of language teachers. 
So I want to conclude this example with the reflections of community members at a capstone workshop and focus group. And I'm going to let you read through the comments that they make and just ask again that you listen for these themes of holism, relationality, belonging, and self-determination. Note the intergenerational connection here of the baby in the arms of the mother, the grandmother, the aunties, the uncles. Talking from the heart. I think this speaks to the fact that it's never too late to start. ILI, as was noted in Iris Stacy's presentation today, is a life journey. The final example I'll share today is from an exciting new national study just funded by the Spencer Foundation entitled Indigenous Language Immersion and Amer Native American Student Achievement. The study includes myself along with my co-PIs, Dene Lakota scholar uh, Tiffany Lee at the University of New Mexico, Hopi scholar Sheila Nicholas at the University of Arizona, and my colleague at UCLA, Michael Seltzer. And what we're interested in doing with this four-year multi-site, mixed-method study is to get a better sense of how ILI is being implemented in diverse regional, linguistic, and cultural contexts. What practices have proven beneficial under what conditions and for what student populations? We just don't have a systematic database on these programs, and it's desperately needed if we're going to be able to further this work, influence uh, policymakers, and provide additional resources for these kinds of programs. In other words, we need this data to make a case at the state, tribal, and federal levels, as well as the international levels, for that matter, with regard to indigenous language rights. So, so that's our intent with this, with this project. So what, what we plan to do to um, address these areas is to do a national survey, a survey, kind of questionnaire survey, of all current ILI programs in the United States, uh, just to get a sense of their key features, what's being done, what approaches are being used, what seems to be working, what the challenges are, how those are being addressed, and the outcomes locally defined. And I've just given you kind of a sample so you can see this isn't a standardized measurement. This is, we want to understand success as it's defined locally. And we'll also be um, conducting six to eight in-depth case studies of diverse programs from across the United States, again, um, and, and comparing those with non-ILI programs. In other words, what is the value added by ILI? If kids didn't have Puente de Hojo to go to, what would schooling look like for them? So we've just returned from a visit to our first foundational site, Navahi, which is a Hawaiian full immersion pre-K through 12 school serving about 400 students in Hilo, Hawaii. The name is actually longer than that. I'm not going to attempt to uh, pronounce it. But um, this is the name that, this is, this is the common name that's used uh, at the school. And it's named after a famous uh, 19th century Hawaiian leader, a legislator, newspaper publisher, and uh, an artist. There are people in the audience, let me just say this, who are from Navahi and are very knowledgeable of it. This is their story to tell, not mine. 
In my concluding remarks today, what I'd simply like to share is a personal story from our recent visit to the school that speaks to the four themes that I've tried to develop in this talk. Navahi accepts students as young as nine months, and on the day of our visit this past September, a nine-month-old child had just been accepted into the infant and toddler program. And as the teacher cradled the sleeping infant in her arms, she explained that the curriculum at this stage focuses mostly on large motor skills and, and vocabulary to prepare children for the Punana Leo or Language Nest preschool. And teachers at this level start teaching the Hakka Lama, which is a 90-syllable syllabary through songs. The teacher said once the children reach the preschool, it takes just a few, a few months before they become fluent. The infant toddler program then, they told us, is kind of like yeast. And parents are in, integrally involved from day one. They're responsible for volunteer work at the school, and if they're not fluent in Hawaiian, they take classes so they can support their children at home. Many Navahi students are the children of graduates or people involved with the school, and indeed this infant's mother is on the staff of the Punana Leo statewide office in Hilo. This is not a place where you drop your kid off at eight and come back at five, the teacher told us. And so as I listened and as we watched and were, were, were taken around uh, to the various components of this school, I couldn't help but think back to the words of Dorothy Sacote all those years before. If your child learns only English, you've lost your, your child. And I thought, what is the trajectory for this nine-month-old infant just enrolled in her first day? of school. If she's like most Navahi students, she'll likely go on to complete her entire pre-K through 12 education there. Think about that. The students in her classes will be peers she's known since infancy. The ninth grade teacher told us, so this is many years down the road, these students have been together since preschool, so they're like family. In her senior year, the child will be eligible for dual credit courses at the University of Hawaii Hilo, a university she may well enroll in as an undergraduate and uh, perhaps attend with Navahi age mates and peers. And in the process of her pre-K through 12 education, I suspect that this child will come to appreciate in a profound way, a lesson we heard repeatedly expressed by older students. As one senior put it, one of the most important things we value is our genealogy. As this child helps tend the gardens that produce food for the school, she'll learn not only ethnobotany and language in the context of doing this work, but she'll also learn reciprocity, responsibility, belongingness, a sense of place, and respect for the land, the people, and the language. Another senior contemplating a Hawaiian photography business after graduating explained to us that her career choice was motivi motivated by just these values. I'm just trying to think of ways to give back to my community and revitalize our language, she said. In this brief talk, I've only skimmed the surface of what ILI looks like in practice. My understandings of it are obviously perspectival, limited, and from an outsider's point of view. I hope I've been successful, though, in sharing some of the lessons ILI teaches and how, through a distinctive parent and whole community approach, much more than language learning is taking place in these programs. I want to conclude by returning to the image in my title slide, which you may now recognize includes Mr. Hubert McCord. And next to him is then 13-year-old Winona Castillo, one of several youth language learners in the Mojave Language Reclamation Project. Mr. McCord's gesture in this photograph speaks to the elder's words with which I began of not losing your child. As he places his hand on Winona's shoulder, he signals his faith in the youth and their parents and his hope 
for the future of his language and his people. Language revitalization is always about people, those who came before, those who are with us now, and those to come. It's not about language as a disembodied thing to be curated and preserved. And that's why ILI and the work of all who have the courage and the commitment to embark down this path are so necessary and so important. Thank you in Navajo. Okay, so we, are, we have 10 minutes for um, question and answers. I, I just wanna thank you so much for that talk. We've seen the benefits of bilingualism from our plenary speakers in terms of cognition, in terms of economics, and now in terms of saving lives, right? Um, so I think it's just a beautiful talk for this afternoon. Questions, Brian has volunteered to run all the way to the back. So raise your hands, um, he's coming. I have to tell you, it's blinding from up here, so. <laughs> thank you for a wonderful talk. Oh, thank very, you. Very interesting. I'm just wondering about the teachers. In these programs, particularly those that have dwindling populations of uh, language speakers, where do the teachers come from and where are they prepared and how, what, do you, what do you think is, is there a challenge kind of in the building that pipeline? Oh, it's huge, the challenge is huge. And there are people in this audience who do this work who can, definitely speak to this um, in, in much greater detail. The Navahi, the Navahi uh, uh, program has a teacher, it's a lab school, and it has a teacher preparation program connected with it. They've, this has taken years, decades and decades to build. It's this whole structure of support. But even they are concerned that their teachers, because they're trained so well, they very often do their pre-service work right there at Navahi, they get plucked off by other schools, other you know, Hawaiian language schools that, uh, that want, to, want their well-trained teachers. Um, so that's why I, I, I tried to emphasize this is such a multi-generational um, commitment that people make to this. Um, and teachers are not only learning to teach, but they're learning to become proficient teachers in a second language, and, and that's doubly hard. With that said, so I think that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful example, but in many other cases, teachers are trained in, in um, programs that don't have a, a clue about any of this. And so they learn it as they are actually teaching. The teachers at Puente talked about learning, you know, becoming ever more literate along with their, with their, their students as they taught in Navajo and taught Navajo literacy. So it's a growing, it's grow your own is really the, is, is, the, is the process and is part of the challenge, but also part of the beauty of putting forth this new generation of, of teachers as well. So that's a very short and simple answer to your question, but um, it's, it's, it's a very important question. I believe there is, is there a session this afternoon on this? And, and Maka, Makalapua, um, Alan Castre will be giving that uh, a presentation on what they're doing in Hawaii. So that would, a symposium, I'm sorry, yes. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for um, such an inspirational work because it inspires us to promote our native languages. I have a question regarding uh, the fact that politically, the nation is, is going through a change, a rough time. And so how would you embrace mm. this process so we can influence mm. our students to see the value of bilingualism, multilingualism, because as, um, language teachers, we struggle with that. Yeah. That in our classrooms, our students only wants to speak 
English, yeah. even though they are native speakers mm -hmm. of Spanish. Mm -hmm. Thank Boy, you. That is, um, that's such an important question. You know, I think, I think we all have to, we all operate from our own positions of, of both power and vulnerability. And those of us who are here in the, at this conference, though, are in positions of, of some influence and power over those children, families, communities with which we interact. And I think we just have to always be cognizant and, and that has to, it, it can't, we can't sort of let that slip. We can't sort of say, well, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm, I'm not going to address that. So I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. The thing I would say to, to, to those students, and I'm not sure if this is exactly what your reference point is, but you know, people don't learn by walls. Walls are things that we bump into and have to go around. And here I'm referring to this discourse about the wall um, on what is already an artificial border um, of people's lands. Uh, so if, to the extent that we're able to open students up to help them think about these things, sometimes metaphors can be useful in that regard. Um, I think that's a way of offering some hope, some other ways of looking at things beyond the wall of that kind of discourse and that sort of narrow-minded, and let's be honest about it, racist, xenophobic discourse that is populating um, popular media and that children are, are, are very well exposed to. Very difficult question to answer. In, in um, is there a, is there a place um, in ILI for students who cannot claim the genealogical connection mm -hmm. to the language? Is there um, is is are we not there yet? The revitalizing must happen within mm. the community. Um, or not? Good question, and again, I would, I would say that this is something that every community and every program sort of has to decide for themselves. I will say, however, that the, the children in the, in the Hawaiian programs are, de are definitely mixed heritage, from mixed heritage backgrounds. The teacher who teaches, uh, there's a, they, they're learning Japanese at Navahi. Um, because Japanese is part of Hawaiian heritage and part of these children's heritage. The teacher is, ja is a native speaker of Japanese who's learned Hawaiian as a, and English, and maybe more, as a second language. The Puente students are all, na they're, they're Navajo Hopi, uh, African American, Native American, um, Hispanic or Latino, uh, and Native American. So they're not all Navajo, they don't come from their, their parents aren't all Navajo parents. So, and, and as one, as the teacher uh, said in, to me in, at, at that particular, in that particular study, we're all mixed and it's beautiful. That's the way life is and that's what they want children to know. So um, I think that it's, it's, it's definitely possible for other children from other backgrounds to be part of these programs and, and in fact they are. But again, I think that's, those are decisions that have to be made locally. And some communities would not, would not want that, explicitly would not want that. But, so that's part of the self-determination and local choice aspect of these programs as well. Thank you, that's a really great question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.